This presentation is a production of the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. The fun was in the sense that there were, there were so many ways it could go. It's just a lot happening without very much structure to our work. Um, there wasn't any guidance documents. There wasn't any uh, information that we had. So much which had to be done and we had to permit facilities. We had to go out and conduct inspections where, where there had been contamination. We had to try to work and try to remediate those sites. Enforcement was stressful because we really didn't have the teeth and the regulations. We had to find money for contracts, none of which really existed and we had to to make, borrow, and steal, basically, to see if we could put together a program that would be responsive. So it was a demoralized staff. There were not enough people. And what they were doing was just trying to do whatever came in the door that morning. On August 2nd, 1978, New York State officials ordered the emergency evacuation of 240 families living within two blocks of an old abandoned canal, the Love Canal. Headlines throughout the nation declared Love Canal the largest man-made environmental disaster in decades. There's quite a lot of interest uh, bordering on hysteria surrounding hazardous waste sites because of Love Canal and Three Mile Island and, and, and all, all sorts of other things that were happening at the time that we were trying to get formed as a department. I remember sitting at my desk one day and a lady called and explained to me that she was afraid to drive her children to daycare because she had to drive down Interstate 80. And in doing so, she had to drive past the old liquid gold facility. Well, the media was just going nuts about it. Uh, one day we collected samples and by the time we put the samples in a cooler, we stopped at a store to get ice. There already was a newspaper on the stands with a front page story and a picture of Howard and I collecting samples from that morning. When there was constant pressure on us from the legislature, from the administration, from the communities, they were growing aware that there was these things called toxic sites or hazardous waste facilities in their midst. The Environmental Protection Agency listed the most hazardous dumps in America. California had 11, including one in a Riverside Canyon called Stringfellow. In, uh, I guess it was 81, 83, Federal EPA sent us a group of IPAs, and that was very helpful. An IPA is an intergovernmental personnel agreement. So these people were on loan to us. And so then we were able to establish an enforcement program, a site mitigation program, and a permitting program. I came up here to actually create the department's enforcement program. I was working for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in San Francisco, so they brought me up for my enforcement expertise to help out the state. I began my work with the department on assignment from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I did a budget change proposal to actually get the first public information and public participation program online for our department. Hazardous waste was the sexiest thing out there. I mean, the legislature was enacting just multiple bills as fast as they could write these things. We're just like, I call them like the go-go years. We could go to the legislature and explain to them what the problem was. I remember taking a phone call from a local representative. He was a Republican, as I recall. But I remember him telling me, he says, Dwight, I really want your help in writing a piece of toxics legislation. I thought, this just sounds fascinating. I'd love to work with you on that. What would you like your legislation to do? And he actually says, well, I don't know, and it's probably best that it do nothing, but I need a piece of toxics legislation, Dwight. It was around this time that the Bond Act was passed. The state passed a $100 million bond initiative. That really kind of accelerated the state's ability to deal with abandoned sites created the state super fund. And one of the things in early years that funded our program was this $100 million bond. Then money was flowing to hire contractors to do remedial investigations and feasibility studies. Money was just flowing in. It got the highest priority. The place just absolutely zoomed with energy. We would sit down and we would do our budget forecasting and we would tell the legislature how many people it need, we needed to actually conduct our job. And I would say, well, I think in the North Coast section, we need three more permit writers. 
And then someone would analyze what I had sent up and send me back a note saying, no, no, Dwight, that's not right. You actually need 11 permit writers. And before I knew it, instead of having three new staff, we'd have 11 new staff for writing permits. We got so many new positions, we didn't have time to interview people, so we had what was called a hiring hall. The department was growing by hundreds of people every year. We interviewed and hired two times the number of people that we had on staff. So when these new people came in, they had no desks to sit at. We had to have them sit at conference tables. What was to become the toxics department was probably no more than 20 or 30 people when I first came. It quickly became 100 and then 200 and then the next thing you know it was 1,000 people. When I got here and came to the department, I was employee number 142. When I left the department five years later, they had just hired employee number 998. And during that time, we weren't just growing a bureaucracy, we were serving the people and protecting them. We had inspectors out there two and three times a week. During one of their visits, they noticed that one of the very large plating tanks, the bottom had ruptured out of it, and acid had leaked through the tank and was going to come in contact with a tank that had cyanide in it. We had the place shut down, contacted EPA and the Coast Guard. They had to come out and pump out those tanks. The neighborhood had to be evacuated for 24 hours because if the acid had come into contact with the cyanide, it would have produced cyanide gas, which is, of course, what is used in the gas chamber in San Quentin. There was a point where gases were migrating from the BKK landfill and residents close by the landfill had to be evacuated. Now, the only orders for evacuation can only come from uh, the, the county health officer, so we had to get them involved and, and move a number of people away from the site uh, into hotels temporarily until the whole situation could be abated. I uh, landed once in Southern California, just got off the plane, and I was met by a meteorologist from South Coast Air Quality Management District who said, here's the dead rabbit. Now, I didn't know anything about a dead rabbit, and there'd apparently been some discussion that oh, those guys in Berkeley can do anything, and that we would be able to do an autopsy on this rabbit and find out why it had died. It was living downwind of these huge stockpiles of alkylation waste that were in the residential area. That's one time that I actually said no. When we took over, the program was being investigated by the FBI. All the press in the state was on their neck. EPA had withdrawn their certification and were not allowing the state to act for EPA. It was chaotic. And there were only two of us trying to review toxicological data. There were stories out there, I think, they might even have been true in some cases of permits written on napkins. We'd write people ladders, and if they didn't comply, we'd write them another ladder. And if they didn't comply, we'd write them another ladder. And, you know, it really didn't have the deterrent value that we were hoping for. And the world basically was looking at DTSC to see what we were doing. There are no directors in charge of the program, and it's utter chaos as far as I can tell. Are these dumps still dangerous? If so, to what extent? We had the Auditor General, we had the EPA, we had the newspapers. Tremendous lack of presence by the state health investigators. 